So welcome everybody. My name is Michael Crawford. I'm the CEO of the Soil CRC. And welcome to today's, to today's webinar on enhancing the representation of soil constraints in decision support systems to be given by Keith Pendleton and Chloe Lay from University of Southern Queensland. Uh, just while we wait for a few more people to come into the room, I'll say a few words of, of introduction. Firstly, recognising that participating in this webinar, we have attendees from across Australia and some international guests as well. Those who are well familiar with the Soil CRC and those who perhaps aren't so familiar with the Soil CRC, I'll just say a few words about who we are and what we're about. Essentially, the, the Soil Cooperative Research Centre is a collaborative soil research effort, a collaboration between 40 participant organisations across Australia and New Zealand. We have eight universities, four state government agencies, a number of industry groups and organisations, and 20 grower groups or farmer groups from across Australia involved in the CRC. We have funding from the Australian government and from our various uh, partners, both cash and in kind. And our mission is to undertake soil related R&D to give farmers the tools and knowledge they need to improve their soil productivity and ultimately their farm profitability. We've got a, re a regular webinar series uh, delivering updates on various projects across our broad <coughs> portfolio of activity. Every fortnight, every two weeks, we're delivering a webinar. The next uh, webinar in this series is in well, in 10 days time, um, we normally have them on a Tuesday, today's a Thursday of course, but normally on a Tuesday. Next one's in, um, on 22nd of September, delivered by Vaughan Higgins from the University of Tasmania, who will be speaking on some social and adoption research we're doing around caring for the land, farm care networks and adoptability of soil improvement techniques and practices. It's very important to understand the <coughs> how we um, the adoptability of the, the research uh, that we're doing and, and how it's best put in the farms of hand, in the hands of farmers. Uh, back to today's session. So a little bit of housekeeping just before we progress. We are recording this session and it will be available via our website for later viewing from those participants and also those who've missed it today. Uh, we have a chat function where you can make various comments uh, along the way. But importantly, if you want to ask questions, please type them into the Q&A function, which you can uh, see at the bottom of your screen on, on Zoom. Type the questions in as you think of them, as you go. And at the end, uh, with about 15 minutes to go, we'll, we'll progress to questions and I'll ask the questions and Keith and Chloe will hopefully be able to answer them. And and uh, that's the most effective way to do it by um, typing it in. Without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. Firstly, we've got Associate Professor Keith Pendleton. He leads the Agricultural Systems and Catchment Modelling Group at the University of Southern Queensland's Centre for Sustainable Agricultural Systems. And he leads a project in the, the Soil CRC uh, related to the topic we're talking about today. A key researcher on the project is Chloe Lay. Chloe is a soil scientist interested in quantifying the effects of soil constraints on crop production and integrating data at different scales. Her PhD focuses on combining geostatistical models with machine learning algorithms to better account for prediction uncertainties in digital soil mapping and crop modeling. Without further ado, I'm going to pass to Keith He'll give some opening introductory remarks and then across to, uh, to Chloe to give the bulk of the presentation. Thank you, Keith. Stop sharing mine and Chloe, if you can share your screen. So thank you everybody for coming along today and listening to um, Chloe and myself speak about um, some of the work we've been doing um, along with our collaborators in the Soil CRC. But, um, on, the, on this project, which has got the kind of convoluted and, and quite long title. And um, so we actually just, we 
we as a team really refer to it as the decision support tool and modeling project um, or the soil decision support tool and modeling project um, as, a, as a bit of a shorter title. But the whole idea of this project really is to um, enhance representation of soil constraints in current models and decision support tools. Um, it's not about building new tools. That's, um, I think that's the focus of future CRC milestones. And, um, and there's, there's um, certainly, there's effort, um, in, or this effort will contribute to that space, but this is really focusing on what, what tools are already in existence now and what models are already in existence now. That we can build in better representation of soil constraints into. Um, and so from that perspective, we've taken a, a bit of a, an approach which relies on the expertise of the entire project team. So in the next slide, please, Chloe, if you, thanks. So before we start, and um, the project team in, in this project is absolutely critical to, to what we've been able to achieve. And um, so there's some big acknowledgements here to the entire project team. Um, so Claire Brownie from um, Beast, um, Birchip Cropping Group, Nathan Craig from Western Midlands Group, Rob Miller from Vertican Productivity Services, and Jane McInnes from Riverina Plains Institute. They're, um, they're in the project team as, as grower group representatives and it's, they provide a really good valuable insight about what is actually useful um, to, to growers and farmers in terms of what we need to do to improve decision support tools. Um, so their, their insight is absolutely, um, is invaluable, is, is really important to what we've been able to achieve to date and what we're planning on doing before this project concludes. Um, we've also got Simon Faraden, um, New South Wales DPI, Nathan Robinson from Fed Uni, and Jonathan Ojeda from UTAS um, as other researchers in the project and have really helped um, achieve what we're gonna to present to you today. And certainly, um, and that, that made significant contributions as well. So even though it's just Chloe and myself, myself speaking to you today, it definitely is a team effort from, from everybody listed there. We've also had some additional input from um, Lucas Van Sweden as the program for leader in CRC. And then also from um, some, organ some people from outside the CRC of, have given us some some very good advice, or and been um, actually champions of some of the activities we're doing as well. So, Paul Nielsen from um, James Cook University um, has been really supportive of our work with the Gypsy Calculator, um, and so a big thank you to Paul, and also Gus um, Manister from some Sugar Research Australia, and Peter Larson as well from Milma Sugar um, Milling as well. Um, again, around their support and what we're trying to achieve with the Gypsy Calculator. Um, and Lee Wang, um, researcher in CSIRO, has been really helpful um, with what we've been able to achieve with phosphorus modelling. Um, and certainly we would not have gotten to where we were without, without his support. So a big thank you goes out to, to those people there and, and those organisations as well for their, for their help in this, this effort. So this, what, what is this modelling project or decision support to, um, project about? And it's, um, there's an output in program four. So this is a bit of, I guess, a bit of internal CRC stuff for, for those that, um, and, and how the program's put together. But there's a um, output three in program four is all about soil, universal soil re-engineering decision support tools. Um, you know, it's colloquially known within, I think, um, as the modeling program. It's not really a modeling program. It's actually about putting the power of models into the hands of, of decision makers, be they growers or policy makers, um, to farm advisors and the like. But it's putting the power of those models into, and, and, um, into, that, into those hands, which is why it often gets referred to as the modeling project and this, or the modeling program. Um, this project is the first step in that, in that quite a long journey. Ultimately we want, you know, the, um, I, I sometimes refer to it as the super model, um, the model which will do everything um, in terms of guiding decisions around how to address soil constraints, um, be it and at various levels as well. So it could be within a field, at a field level, at a farm level, even maybe at a regional level. Um, so to achieve that, that super model, um, it's gonna be, it's a long process. And this, this project is the first pro, um, step on that journey. It's adding value to existing tools because we don't wanna reinvent the wheel right from the start. We just wanna build on, on what other people have done. You know, to rip the, um, to, paraf or to, to rip the quote from Google Scholar, we wanna stand on the shoulders of giants and the giants that we're standing on here are the existing um, models and tools which gets used. So we're trying to um, improve improve different aspects of digital um, of decision support tools in response to soil constraints, um, and those aspects that we're targeting are actually guided by our um, the grower group representatives in the project team, and so they they nominate the particular um, maybe the, the the tool or the the constraint which might be lacking in a particular tool. We talk about how it 
how it um how we might go about addressing it, and then us as researchers go away and start working on it um, to bring back something to those to those um, grow group representatives to take out to their members to maybe um, ground truth for us. Um, so that that's sort of the approach we're taking. We're going to get to that in a in a bit more of a later slide. The other part of we're trying to do is secure the longevity and tools of models. So. Um, one of the things that often comes up as a problem with a with the decision support tool or a model being developed out of any research project is there's no support post what happens or post after the project that, that has developed that tool and, and ultimately these things die, these tools die and, and no longer function. There might be an update in an operating system which causes them not to function. And I'm, I'm just as guilty as any other researcher in creating tools which no longer work. Um, I did create a, um, a number of nitrogen fertiliser decision tools for the dairy industry in Tasmania at one stage. Can't get them to run anymore. Um, and so part of the other effort is actually securing the longevity of tools and models and what we do here. So we're trying to work within existing tools that have good user bases, that have um, fundamental key support um, to maintain them going forward. So we don't lose the efforts that we put in here just because of something breaks and no one is around to fix it in the future. Um, and one of the key ones is our platform update to Gypsy is a good example of that. Um, and ultimately, so while this project is about evaluating existing tools to get stuff out to, to users quickly um, and science out to users quickly to use in, in those tools, um, the, tool, the development of the tools and the modeling approaches that we're doing in this project is going to um, help us achieve that overall objective of developing that universal um, decision support tool for soil constraints. So that, that's super model, if you like. Um, next slide, please, Chloe. So covered in this webinar, we've, we've covered, a, we're working on a number of constraints, the ones we're going to talk about today um, as approaches to modeling phosphorus fertility in, in soils. Um, believe it or not, phosphorus is not well represented across decision support tools and, and um, agricultural models. Um, the focus a lot tends to be on nitrogen and water. Um, phosphorus is there, but might be there as a prototype or might not be fully developed. So this is something we're working on to address. Um, we're looking at the impacts of sodicity on, on crop yields and, um, and amelioration, particularly with our focus on the gypsy model or the gypsy decision support tools. We're also focusing on a couple of logistical problems, which might not um, seem like soil constraint issues, but when you delve right into them, they actually are. So two things which, which have come out from um, out, of the, out of the project team was the, some issues around um, water use by weeds during fallows um, and the, the timing of, of killing those weeds and the impact of, that has. Um, and this shares a lot of commonality with cover crops, by the way, um, as well. So, there's, um, so it's, the question essentially is that there is how long does a grower potentially have to spray out weeds in, during, a, during a fallow period before the, the water use by those weeds becomes significant, significantly impacts on, on um, soil water store or the amount of water stored and, and hence crop yields. And the other one is nitrogen fertilization around timing of application and how, how risky um, different application practices might be around um, getting nitrogen onto fields as well. Um, and one of the key things that we've we uncovered is there's not many models out there that when essentially no model that we could find that did lateralization. Um, it's sort of assumed that it does, in, in modeling world, it's assumed it doesn't occur. Um, it doesn't actually happen that the nitrogen applications and the nitrogen fertilizer applications are perfect. So that's a, and, but we know that's not, they're, net, they're not perfect when it happens on farm. There's a whole heap of, whole heap of compromises that get made, which might mean that there is lateralization losses happening in reality. So we're trying to address that by um, actually building in some lateralization capacity into a key model. Um, we've got some other, soil constraints which we are we are trying to tackle within the project which we're not going to get to today um, mainly because of time constraints we'd love to be able to speak to you for, for hours and hours and hours on, on end about this stuff um, but I think you'd probably all get pretty bored and I've, um, and Michael would probably cut me off anyway um, but we're looking at things like um, effect of, of claying and, and some of the really unique soil practices that are happening in Western Australia and how we might represent them um, and, and the impacts they, they then have um, we we're looking at, um, at soil water, um, particularly in very wet environments, um, in, in very, very wet environments. So we're talking here, you know, the irrigated sugar um, cropping systems, but also um, really wet, wet winter environments in Tasmania. Um, looking at specific, a specific issue around um, representing Australian sugarcane cultivars in, um, in irrigation decision support tools, um, a key issue that 
that Rob Miller from Verdict and Productivity Services um, highlighted with us, and also looking at within paddock nitrogen distribution and how we can how we can better represent that um, within within our point level models. Next, yeah. So when we look at soil constraints, so this is this is a bit of a background, and I um, mean, if you really want to delve into the detail of this. Um, We've got a big interest in this. This actually come. This isn't. This is actually an outcome of a previous project, one of the scoping projects, um, in the in the um, that we did in the soil CRC um, initially. If, if everybody remembers those those first round of, of scoping projects, um, and so there is a report um, within the members area of the CRC website to, that you can really get into and to really understand some of this if you if you're particularly interested in it. But one of the key things we identified um, and we were able to quantify through that report was how what existing models do in terms of soil representation and existing decision support tools do in terms of soil representation and i apologize I used models and decision support tool terminology um, interchangeably because um, for me it doesn't matter what it is whether it's a research model or a farmer based tool it's still a model but um, that's just how my brain works um, but one of the things we we sort of or one of the things we've identified identified through that initial scoping review was that yeah Soil water dynamics and nitrogen dynamics are well represented, well, or well represented um, across a whole range of tools and decision support tools. There is some key gaps which we've just highlighted on the previous slide, which need to be addressed, um, particularly in making making these models more useful. But generally, there's lots of um, they're well represented. The next level down, this phosphorus and other nutrients and soil compaction, and so this is salinity are not well represented or not well represented, but have the framework in place to be able to address relatively easily um, and relatively efficiently. Hence, what, so there's a key focus in the project on particularly phosphorus, um, but the learnings that we've got taken out of phosphorus could be applied to other nutrients, by the way. It's just we've targeted phosphorus being, it's probably the, the next cab off the rank after nitrogen. Um, if we were to go again, probably the next one would be potassium. Um, but so we're, we're targeting phosphorus as a, as, a, as a nutritional limitation and what we're doing there. We've got sodicity and solidity um, being targeted as well. So the frameworks, the fundamental frameworks exist within the, within the models. We just need to improve it a bit and we've probably got a good outcome there um, or in the, in the tools, same as soil compaction. The next layer down, the soil disease and pH level, that's the really tricky stuff and probably needs a, um, it, it would require a significant level of investment to bring up. And to do that kind of work is probably going to chat we need to say drop a significant portion of the rest of what we're doing to get say soil diseases better represented in models and so this is probably the way we go is it worth the level of investment for in this project to address um, and this is what we we discuss constantly as a project team or when we meet as a project team about where we're going to allocate resources and while soil diseases and soil ph should be absolutely awesome to do and really intellectually stimulating on, on how to do it um, the question is, or the, the challenge often is, do we have the level of resourcing and what we're going to trade off to address those things? So then the approach that we're taking around this development is, um, first of all, identifying the constraints. And we do that as a project team and particularly our grower. We rely on our grower group members in, in the project team to really inform us here. Um, there is some constraints which are listed as soil CRC milestones, which were we're targeting as well because they, they're deliverables that the soil CRC has. The other ones are, well, what is going to be of most value? So identify those constraints. We do the research um, in that area, then move on to a, um, and that might, so that's literature reviews, that's meta-analyses, that's looking at past research, that's collecting all the data. Um, and we've found some really great data sets from outside Australia, by the way, um, to help us, particularly with the phosphorus one. Um, but then we get into the development. So that's actually the crunch, crunch work, the analysis, the modeling, the coding up, what we need to do, the coding of the decision support tools. And we're actually sitting um, with a couple of our, um, our developments actually sitting um, now in the testing and tuning phase or just about. So Gypsy as a calculator has just gone out to the, the um, or the new iteration of the Gypsy calculator had just gone out to a key group for beta testing um and so and we've had some had some good feedback already from from the beta testers um around that um which then we're we're building um addressing those those um criticisms those comments um and then hopefully we'll get it out for another round of testing um relatively soon some of the other tools we're working on like the the um, logistical aspects of spraying out weeds um in terms of their water use and, and soil water loss um we're still very much at the development and coding stage 
it. Um, and then some of our other work is, is at the research stage. So um, some of our so other sodicity work is sitting still at that, at, that um, at that lower level. So on that, I'll hand over to Chloe um, to actually talk specifically about some of the specific aspects of the project. Thank you, Keith. Um, so as Keith mentioned, that uh, phosphorus fertility is actually quite limitedly represented in a lot of decision support tools compared with nitrogen and carbon dynamics. And phosphorus fertility is also one of our uh, so national milestones for this project. And one major challenge that restricts uh, the use of phosphorus modeling especially by grower groups to improve phosphorus use efficiency is the difficulty in matching measured soil peak fractions to conceptual and modelable pools in soils with different mineral properties. Uh, for example, Epsian is widely used here in Australia. It divides its soil phosphorus pools into three different conceptual pools, the label people, the unavailable inorganic phosphorus pool, and the organic phosphorus pool. The label people represents the proportion of total soil phosphorus that is potentially bioavailable to plants. However, this is not directly equated uh, um, equated to any measure, uh, measured soil phosphorus values. Then um, for, uh, to initialize uh, phosphorus modeling dynamics in Epsian requires careful calibration and a certain degree of expertise, uh, then this uh, actually uh, potentially limits uh, its uh, uh, applicability to wider groups of people. So what we did, uh, like Keith mentioned, is that we've uh, obtained uh, a very good data sets from uh, United States uh, for a long-term loosened phosphorus trial. And then we use that to test an inverse modeling approach to demonstrate that Epsian can model phosphorus dynamics uh, quite reasonably. And then we applied that approach to the better fertilization decision database for crops in Australia for a pure simulation based study to develop um, empirical relations between soil phosphorus test values such as Cobalt P test and Gray P test values to the label phosphorus pools in Epsian so that the initialization of phosphorus modeling can be better and more accurate and uh, easier. So uh, for the long-term phosphorus experiment, uh, it was conducted for uh, seven years since 1998 to 2004 for four different phosphorus rates on two different soil types. Um, uh, one is a JAMA soil called silty, uh, uh, called JAMA soil and it's a silty clay loam and one is a Roromy soil which is a silt loam. And since uh, Lucerne will be dormant during winter so what we did is first to calibrate Lucerne winter dormancy rules under phosphorus unaware based on max, uh, max phosphorus treatment on the Laramie soil. And these rules were then validated using the JAMA data. So that is uh, showed in this figure. So we can see that um, basically Epsian is able to uh, pre uh, predict the yield uh, well under the winter dormancy rules. Then uh, we parameterized the Lucerne phosphorus uh, uh, parameters in Epsian because current Lucerne P module is uh, Lucerne module is not phosphorus aware. And then we adapted it from soybean phosphorus model and from literature. So then we applied an inverse modeling approach. We initialized the label phosphorus pool to maximize the links concordance correlation co coefficients between our observed data and Epsian predicted yield under phosphorus aware. And what this does is essentially, uh, and then we basically compared uh, the herb HP predicted by Epsian and uh, our measurement. Measurements. So this proves that Epsian can model phosphorus dynamics 
reasonably well with a good initialization of label phosphorus uh, value, then we correlated epsilon simulated label phosphorus uh, to our soil uh, gravity test. So uh, soil was tested, uh, soil P was measured in uh, using gravity test after each harvest uh, in five centimeter increments to a depth of 20 meter sentiments, uh, no, centimeters. And uh, as the soil profile in our epsilon uh, profile that we used is down to 300 centimeters, uh, we harmonized the predicted label P to the depth level of our measurement. And then we made the correlation which uh, represents the uh, relationship between Brady test and our label phosphorus pool. And uh, for validation, we used a leaf one soil out cross validation where data from when soil was completely taken out and then uh, we calibrated this uh, uh, test using data from the other, uh, the other soil and uh, vice versa. And we actually achieved a very good uh, correlation for both our calibration and uh, validation uh, with a concordance value of 0.9. So which means that um, um, Epsilon is able to predict uh, label P uh, uh, values uh, and brain P can be used to initialize uh, label P value using our relationship. So once we're certain that this approach can be used, we've used the uh, better fertilizer uh, decisions uh, for crops database to do a simulation study to derive relationships uh, on Australian soil uh, phosphorus measurements and label people in Epsilon. And uh, in, in that uh, BFDC database, uh, there are wheat trials uh, conducted from 1958 to 2011 for the eight uh, soil groups that displayed here from five major soil orders. So um, these are the soils that there is uh, that has a co P to relative yield relationship, and then. Basically, what we did is extract the F soil, uh, soil profiles for these eight soil types. So that's the F soil profiles distributed across Australia for that eight soil types. And we randomly sampled 20 years uh, from the duration of the child. And then for each sampled year, we ran weight simulations on the phosphorus unaware at those locations to obtain water limited yield potential. So that represents our 100% uh, relative yield. And then we extract uh, each corresponding coval p values um, to that um, yield, uh, yield, relative yield on the curve. This uh, then we come compute the expected yield at that location for each coval p value in terms of uh, kilogram per hectare. Then uh, we apply the same inverse modeling approach, basically parameterize label p so that the difference between our predicted yield and the expected yield is minimized. So by this step, we essentially generated the same yield response curves in in terms of label p values in Epsilon, then we could create coval p to label p relations for the uh, for that surface depth, uh, subsurface depth, and this is a very uh, so intensive like simulation study. Um, the reason that we only sample twenty years instead of run all the years is just by running for this. Um, uh, 320 profiles or so. Uh, it's actually about 65,000 hours of computational time. And then, so then we correlate that label 
the mean label p values for the first depth level and then the second depth level to that uh, coval p um, we fitted different nonlinear and linear regression functions and uh, basically selected the most parsimonious fit based on archaic key information criterion for example um, for the red chromosome you can see here that the a first layer is actually a nonlinear regression with three parameters where the second layer uh, uh, a linear relationship is fitted. Uh, we also conducted uh, cross -valid validation using five fold cross validation. So um, each time one fifth of the profiles were removed from the calibration data set and then uh, uh, and then used uh, fit the data fit the relationship with the remaining uh, profiles and then use the derived model to predict for that uh, left out uh, uh, one fifth of the data and repeat the whole process for five times. And all relations showed an R squared concordance value above 0 0.87. So which means our relationship is um, uh, quite well to represent uh, label uh, uh, coval p, to translate label uh, uh, coval p values to the label p values in Epsilon. So this essentially allows the initialization of Epsilon label people using common soil phosphorus test values. And we developed this modeling framework uh, to uh, not just parameter soil phosphorus, but can also be applied to other nutrients. Uh, so currently we're working to incorporate this into the UI interface in Epsilon Classic for the soil types that we've covered and for the soil tests covered. And potentially with um, with equations to transform uh, for, uh, from, for example, uh, Cowell P to Awesome P, so then uh, more soil tests of phosphorus can be used to initialize um, Epsilon. And uh, we will look into incorporating it into Epsilon next gen, but currently the soil nutrient module uh, and particularly to do with key dynamics is still under development. So this will happen in later stages. And um, so this is also a key soil constant that um, actually all our grower groups um, have a very strong interest in. So the decision support tools that we've identified uh, during our last project meeting with all the grower groups is the Gypsy software, as Keith mentioned that um, the original developers like Paul Nelson um, from JCU and um, SRA have given us a lot of feedbacks and support uh, in basically doing a, a platform update for Gypsy. So as you can see, this was the old Gypsy, well, original Gypsy interface. So it's a Windows desktop uh, software built in 2000. So, and it calculates uh, Gypsy requirements for sugarcane based on profile data. What we did is to transform it into a web-based tool uh, to allow easy access. And also all the source code of this development is publicly available in GitHub so that if people want to do continued development after the project or uh, if other, other researchers want to add, uh, add on features to the software, they could, uh, they could do it. And also uh, we've uh, implemented a variable rate management based on uh, digital soil mapping products such as uh, ESP maps and uh, cation exchange capacity, uh, CEC maps. And um, we are working on a meta analysis to, uh, uh, and also sourcing data from uh, potentially from other projects in the soil CRC uh, so that we could expand the region that is co currently covered with this variable rate management and also potentially expand uh, the crops that covered because uh, the original Gypsy was built for sugarcane we are looking to incorporate, for example, wheat. Hi, Chloe, so, it's Michael. 
We've got about three minutes left. Okay. Yeah. So that's the Gypsy interface. And so basically, uh, the next step of this is uh, we're looking to um, implement, for example, a smart solution. Basically, uh, as a farmer, you can key in your budget and then uh, it will actually calculate variable rate applications for different zones or for, uh, so that you can maximize your return for the whole field. And yeah, and now I'll pass on to Keith on weight filter usage during that long. Yeah, and you can also download the reports from this new Gypsy. Great, so just quickly, a um, couple more slides to go. The, um, so another aspect of the project, we're looking at, at that weed water use that I mentioned right at the start, and this is it's logistical problem really. So what's the, what's the spraying window to kill summer weeds before they use too much water and, and start impacting on, on winter crop yields? Um, so the, the focus here is for us to model weed water use across a range of locations, um, Riverina, Western Victoria and Western Australia. Um, using existing weed models, this is not actually a model actually having us to build a new model. Um, we are doing a bit of tool development work associated with modelling outcomes. Um, that tool development work is in the fellow arm tool, but we've actually got some pretty good existing weed models um, and we're using the AppSim framework for that. Um, so next slide, Chloe. So it's actually, a, it's not really a modelling problem, it's actually a computational problem. Um, there's over, well, nearly 5 million different potential combinations of options here to investigate. Um, and that equates to 60,000 hours of computational time. Um, so if we're running this on a desktop or even 10 desktops, we'd probably blow them up. Um, this kind of activity requires supercomputers. And that's what we're using. We're using the Fork supercomputer at USQ to solve this, this computational problem. Um, and it gets an absolute hammering from, from us um, fairly regularly around and, and running weeds, weed simulations on it. Um, and then we're taking all the outputs for that um, and implementing it into a quite a user-friendly interface, the fellow arm interface, um, available at www.armonline.com.au. Um, um, and there's a, that's one of the tools, the, the arm tools, the fellow arm tool. Um, quite a very simple click, um, only several options for, for a user to click. And it essentially delves into all this data, all this model output and presents to you the results which are reflective to your situation. Um, so it's pretty close to beta testing. So we're looking for volunteers to, to, for beta testers um, for this improvement to fellow arms. So um, reach out to me and let me know if you've got, um, if you're interested in, in beta testing this tool with us. The other aspect that we're doing, and this is this work here is actually, um, I'm gonna talk about it, but it's really Jonathan Ojeda at, at UCAS has really driven this and, and gotten this to quite an amazing point. Um, but it's the envelatilization question and the challenge we've got here. And there's, there's two, two questions which come out. One is the logistical consequences of putting, on, putting out N during a summer fallow and how much nitrogen was lost to volatilization through that pro or doing that practice. And then also the next question was the seasonal losses of biovolatilization from sugarcane crops. Two things we actually can't answer um, with the current modeling platforms. Um, so really what we're trying to do is model volatilization and build a framework for modeling volatilization. And we're doing this, we're taking two approaches to modeling volatilization um, and we're you know, implementing them within a modeling framework. We are trying, but we, what we're really, the brick wall we're hitting up against here is we need more data for testing against the, the actual volatilization data um, is difficult to come across. So if anybody has a data set around volatilization losses, please let me know. Um, we'd be very appreciative if, if you can um, share that with us. Um, there's potential outcomes from this is to go into, again, the fallow arm tool or the crop arm tool um, is to provide it out to growers to be able to access and, and understand volatilization, be it within crop, um, particularly within sugar cane crops or within um, fallow um, fertilizer practices. But also the plans is to implement it within the AppSim framework. Essentially, so, um, large-scale modelling programs like the paddock to reap um, modelling activities um, can access and in, uses this methodology to improve their, their modelling um, outputs as well. So we've got, some, as, as I mentioned at the start, there's some other, um, other soil constraints we're going to tackle. I don't think I need to go through that as, 
as well. But there's also then um, probably some future opportunities around climate change, change scenario modeling um, with, with some of the soil development work that we've been doing in this project and how those, those responses might change under future, future climate scenarios. So with that, I think that is our last slide. Um, yep, sweet. Um, and we'll, uh, I'm, I'm ask, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dave and Chloe, for that excellent presentation, the overview of some of the research you're doing into incorporating our knowledge around the whole range of our soil parameters and constraints into models, the FSIM uh, suite of models and, and, and the like, so we can actually get this knowledge out to the end users in a more effective way. So, as we said at the start, type questions in the Q&A box. At this stage, uh, we've just got the one question in there. Um, so please uh, add to that. Um, I will read the question out. And uh, the first question is from Nanfi, Nanfi Boland. Great presentation. The overseer modeler is used to predict phosphorus nutrient budgeting, including leaching in New Zealand. Are you planning to use this model in your project and to apply this model to Australian soil conditions? Um, yeah, so as a as a someone who worked as a scientist in the dairy industry for a while, I'm pretty familiar with with overseer and um, how do I? I'm trying to word this in a way where I can be I don't get myself into trouble. Um, so because overseer has got some there's different viewpoints about overseer, but um, well personally overseer is a is a model. It's a nutrient budgeting tool and a, a pretty good nutrient budgeting tool when it's used for that purpose. Um, it might be being um, oh, that's enough. I'll, I'll say that's enough. I'll say about overseas use. Um, the phosphorus modelling that we're doing is around phosphorus for, is really to drive um, or provide ability to do phosphorus fertiliser responses. So it's not nutrient budgeting modelling per se. Um, it's it's the fertiliser response modelling. So the stuff that um, Chloe presented there will now enable once that's implemented, um, we will actually enable things like yield profit, if, if yield profit can be built um, or phosphorus can be built into yield profit, to then explore um, crop responses to phosphorus fertilisers just like it does for nitrogen fertilisers. Um, we can do the same thing within crop arm, which also if you can do the fertiliser responses, we could look at the, the phosphorus fertiliser responses in that. So it's it's not a nutrient budgeting exercise, it's a, more a fertiliser or soil fertility response exercise. All right, thanks Keith. Uh, in, in the absence of any other questions, and, and please attend these here, type questions in the Q&A box. Just look at a few more minutes. I'll take a chairman's prerogative and uh, one of, uh, a question around um, other constraints around uh, acidity, Keith, or, or Chloe, around pH, uh, for example. To how easy is that to able to be handled, um, both pH and all the associated um, aluminium or manganese toxicities? Difficult. Um, yeah, it's it's the modelling of pH itself is is relatively easy. In its, I probably didn't tease this out when I spoke to spoke to it on that slide. But it's all the associated toxicities that come out of it, um, which makes it really difficult to do. Um, so often when we look at you know, the 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 workaround solution that we used to apply, and and we still do in some cases for for modelling a lot of those those things like pH constraints and um, or even soil compaction constraints is to put in, just put impermeable layers within the soil um, aspects of the decision support tool or the, or the model. So essentially reduce the bucket size, which captures some of the impact of that, that soil constraint has on, on crop growth. Um, but it doesn't capture those other more difficult things and the interacting things like aluminium toxicity, um, or manganese toxicity. Those sorts of they they become really challenging, and those nutrient toxicities become quite challenging to model. So, again, it's one of those ones. Like for want of a better word, we've almost put it in the too hard basket for this project because we wanted those those wins, those get stuff out to growers that we knew we could achieve, um, and get a, a number of developments out to growers um, that we could achieve. That that pH stuff, I would imagine these things are going to be covered off in the future projects, which are going to take probably a more different approach to how we model and, and tackle these things. So more, I guess, drawing on, on um, more statistical approaches and artificial intelligence approaches to, to deal with this rather than rather than a straight up and down biophysical approaches, which is the, the more like the approach that we're taking in this project. All right. 
Thank you, Keith. Uh, I'm just about to close off. We do have another question just popped up. Thanks, Kirsty. So models like AppSim don't seem to have dynamic soil structure modules and seem highly reliant upon texture in particular. Given that structure, particularly where impacted by biological processes, can impact local hydrological process responses. Is this area being considered for further development? Yeah, certainly a, a challenge. So there's the there's there's aspects of the biological um, responses which are covered in in existing models, um, usually through the soil carbon um, pools and the dynamics there and the, the interaction that then has on um, nutrient availability. So. I mean, Absim's, it's not just Absim, we could pick on any, any tool or, or model and we probably they generally take a, a similar approach. But some of the stuff that we've been doing with the, the work that's been happening with the phosphorus in this project now then facilitates us actually linking the phosphorus pool to the carbon pool and looking at the exchange of, of or organic, how, how the organic phosphorus pools then get exchanged with the mineral pools um, and by, through that biology process. The same thing with the nitrogen pool so that they are captured to some extent but um, yeah the, the textural or the, the the changes that can happen by dramatic or massive increases in um, in carbon on the physical properties of the soil is not well captured um, we probably gonna that's probably going to be something we're going to run up against when we start really getting into some of the Western Australian soil re-engineering practices and how we're going to tackle them and you know we've been talking about some very dramatic um, modifications to existing models to capture that um, and, and how we might go about it. So there may be some, some work to there about changing structural properties dynamically. Um, be get, it's gonna be quite challenging, but it's also gonna be very intellectually a lot of fun to do. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an aspect we are aware of, um, but it's again a, a big challenge, but something we're probably, we're gonna, we're gonna have a crack at, I think, by the end of the project. Okay, very good. I see no further questions and we're up on time, so we'll, we'll start to wrap up here. Thank you once again, Keith and Chloe, for the presentation, for the overview of your project and, and the research work into further enhancing decision support systems in relation to the range of our soil parameters and constraints. If I can refer attendees uh, to our website and also to our social media, um, Twitter, Source RC, uh, LinkedIn, Source RC, and our YouTube uh, with our Source RC site there to subscribe to those various channels to for updated information about future webinars and, and other activities in the Source RC. As I said earlier, we do have a, um, a program in, um, sorry, a webinar in, in 10 days' time on the 22nd of September, and then we'll be releasing uh, details on, on future webinars in, in coming weeks. So look at our website, subscribe to our newsletter, and you'll be updated on our future webinars. And you'll be able to view a copy of this uh, webinar online in a couple of days time. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.